it's, I think, a lot a lot worse for a parent themselves to feel the stress and pressure associated with all these things than to feed their child to GMO. And that's not even a thing. Like, that's not even a, like, a GMO, I'm not just going to give my little bit, like, here, here's a GMO to eat, buddy. Like, I'm going <laughs> to sprinkle some all over your food. You're going to have all the GMOs for breakfast today. No, like, that's not how it works either. Mother, do you think they'll drop the bomb? Mother, do you think they'll like the song? Hello, everyone. Welcome to another scientastic episode of Trolling with the Logic, where we bring the hammer down on pseudoscience, unreason, and superstition on a bi-weekly basis. I am your host, Nathan Dickey, and with me today are half the usual gang, Cal. Hi there. Yeah, uh, glad to be here, and I'm going to say I'm totally chemical-free. And Kitch is with us today. Uh, and I'm the opposite. I am full of alcohol, rage, and regret. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you have a case of Monsanto. I have a full-blown case of raging Monsanto at the moment. <laughs> and uh, this week we are joined by a special guest. Natalie Newell is one of the hosts of the Excellent Science Enthusiast podcast. She is an advocate of skeptical science-based parenting and is director and co-producer of the upcoming Science Moms documentary. According to her website, this documentary aims to give a voice to the science-minded moms, the women who are too often drowned out by the fear mongers, the shamers, and the celeb moms. So basically, she's the anti-Jenny McCarthy. Welcome to the show, Natalie. <laughs> Ooh, I, I like that. I, I really, I'm, I like being the anti Jenny McCarthy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And that's a awesome introduction. So no thanks. Uh, we're talking today about what has come to be known in internet speak as the mommy blog before Natalie helps us define that a little bit of background. The general public is fucking scared to death of science and technology today. This is very sad and very distressing for those of us who understand the myriad ways in which science benefits and improves our lives and well-being and just how dangerous it is to deny scientific evidence and deny what it has given us in the modern world. Some of the biggest sources of unfounded fear today are in biotechnology and medicine, especially GMOs and vaccines. Those are the two that the fear mongers are really driving home their message with. And one of the most insidious uh, manifestations of this is in the mommy blog phenomena. Some of them are well-meaning and sincere and good-intentioned, and others are spreading misinformation in ways that they know is dishonest. So what does this term mommy blogger denote? What are we talking about when we use the term mommy blog, which some might interpret to be derogatory or a mean way to talk about them. Yeah, I mean, because I, I, I was thinking about that, like, what is a mommy blog? And I mean, I guess obviously it is, you know, any any blog or place on the internet that's devoted to to issues of parenting and and child development and all of that. But yeah, it, it does it does sound derogatory, doesn't it? Because I don't know. I guess I never really prior to making science moms and really kind of diving into what was out there on the internet, I wasn't really a reader of, you know, like, quote, unquote, mommy blogs, just because I felt like every time I would go to websites that were geared towards like before I had kids geared towards pregnancy, and then geared towards, you know, kids, it felt like, I mean, maybe it was the comment sections, actually, that that deterred me, because it was just like this, I mean, kind of just like a pissing contest of who's like, who's a better parent. <laughs> Well, we know that internet comment sections are complete dumpster yeah. fires um, anyways. And I feel like these kind of parenting sites just draw out the worst in people sometimes. But I think that the, this whole idea of mommy blogging, it makes it sound like the person who is writing them maybe doesn't actually have an expertise in anything other than being a parent. So I don't know. I feel like Maybe that's where some of the derogatory idea of this of the mommy blog comes from. Like one of the first ones I thought of when we were going to talk about this was like 
modern alternative mama. Nathan, I sent you, I I sent you a a link (laughs) the other day from that. And so that, that's the one that popped into my head. Here is somebody who's just putting herself out there as a mama, you know, and, and that's it. Like, here are my credentials. I'm a mom. And I don't know. I, I guess that, hey, that's relatable. There are lots of moms that are looking for like minded people, but I don't view a blog like this as a place where people should be getting their information on how to raise children. The mommy blog, I don't think, should ever replace real advice from doctors and experts in various fields. And I think sometimes it has replaced the experts. This is because I think um, when you talk to these parents, the line you hear a lot is, yeah, the scientific evidence says this and the white lab coats in their ivory tower say this, but I'm a parent. Are you telling me that these scientists know better than me as a parent? That's the line you hear a lot. How do you respond to that? Yeah, it's like that very famous Jenny McCarthy quote, wasn't it? I know by my mommy instincts that I'm right. It doesn't yeah. matter what this guy sitting next to me says. Yeah, I mean, I have I have two children of my own. And just by having them, it didn't make me an expert in in medicine and food safety and all of that stuff. So like, spoiler alert, you don't get a degree in all of these things when you have kids. And and I understand, I mean, I guess that mommy instinct or whatever, to the extent that you have these people, these kids that mean more to you than, you know, pretty much anything and their happiness and their safety and their well-being means the most to you. But that doesn't make you all knowing and it doesn't give you this this power to understand more than people who actually understand science and medicine and food and all of that. So I I think she's just kind of full of shit with a lot of what <laughs> she says. So so yeah, that that's what I think. The blog yeah. in question is as you said modern alternative mama and the article is called how to handle food questions during the holidays. And this is a uh, yeah. I was sitting there shaking my head seeing this because it's quite a stark example of, you, you might even say it's on the extreme end of the spectrum of these kinds of blogs. Mm-hmm. It, it basically lays out how to police what your children are eating when relatives are over for holiday meals. There's even a section called, what if someone's feeding your kids? I know, it's like you cue, cue some ominous music, like yeah. somebody is, is just <laughs> actually injecting the tomato with the blue liquid from the syringe right in front of you, and you are in this crazy GMO conspiracy at Christmas dinner. Bizarre. It almost it's reads really... like a, one of those religious training tracks. Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, will give out training pamphlets to train JWs on how to talk and proselytize the people. And this is kind of like one of those things where it's laying out how to respond to family members trying to feed your kids stuff you don't want them to eat and how to negotiate with them. And it lays out different options for different approaches you can take. And it's just insane. No, it's it's really it's really strange. And I mean, you you brought up, you know, comparing it to to religion. I mean, I think that some people hold their beliefs about food. It's almost like a religious belief. It, the, these are deeply held beliefs that people have. The people who are, I guess, reading and taking advice from a blog like this, they believe really strongly in this stuff. They've just been indoctrinated with this and are now passing it down to their kids. And I guess that's where I kind of have a little bit of a problem. They're passing down their anxieties to their children, too. I mean, I, I just, I don't know. I feel like it's giving them kind of a messed up view of, of the world and food. And, you know, we have, we just have so many things that we can worry about as parents and as people. And, you know, we have a pretty safe food supply and that really shouldn't be one of them at this point. And then just bringing it to that level of how to essentially police your relatives and your children at the holidays around the dinner table. It, it's just strange. Yeah. I just want to pipe in because the other, Really, we, well, the more, probably the most insidious nature of the mommy blogs is the kind of the shaming culture that goes on. It's kind of the most intense place on the internet. I've seen it where, you know, if you disagree or if you question it, you're just a, they use probably the worst words a parent wants to hear is that you're a bad parent. You know, those yeah. are kind of, I can imagine those are soul crushing words to, you know, if they ever got lobbed at you, you would just, 
Are you aware of uh, a woman, Sarah Schultz? She does the blog Nurse Loves Pharma. Yes, yes. yes. And I remember she did a blog said last year, said, I, you know, I don't feed my kids organic and that doesn't make me a bad mom. And I, and the comment on that was just the most horrific, you know, vitriol directed at her for it. Mm-hmm. I would say, oh, you know, what's this real undercurrent? I mean, I don't know where this is, cut, but it's so prevalent in the mommy blogging community, this. No, it's it's really bad. And actually, I, I remember that um, that post that she wrote, because I definitely share that on my like science moms page. And and what's interesting is that if I share something like that on you know a page that I run, the comments are like, oh, I'm so glad that there is somebody that is speaking out about this, like because yeah. I don't I don't feed my kids all organic either. So. I mean, I'm I'm always so happy to see somebody who puts themselves out there like that saying, you know, I'm not buying into all the myths around food and my and I'm still, you know, I'm a parent. I'm making these choices and it makes other people feel like, OK, I'm OK with making these choices, too, because it's awful out there yeah. if you are in the wrong place as a reasonable parent. Yeah, because the one thing about Sarah's blog was it was very, con- you know, it wasn't aggressive anyway. She mm-hmm. was saying, if you feed them organic, that's great. That's your choice. This is what I do. It's my choice. Let's yeah. just get along. But the abuse she faced on her own blog was just, I, I was stunned when I read it. No, it's its shocking. And I mean, I was thinking of an experience I had uh, last year in the fall. I went with some um, other like local science-minded folks to a... Um, it was a Moms Across America and March Against right. Monsanto um, food justice uh, thing at the Capitol in D.C. And we were screamed at, like screamed at, because yeah. my friend Jenny, who's in my film, she was screamed at for pretty much, you know, being pro biotechnology. A mom was saying was screaming at us that she uh had cured her child of food allergies because of an organic diet. And pretty much how could we, as people on the other side, not buy into that? And how, you know, we're essentially harming our children because we don't buy into that. I mean, it's, yeah, it was not like anything I'd ever seen before in real life. Because it was, it was like an internet comment section come to life. You know, just the nastiness behind that kind of thing. And unfortunately, I think it comes from a place of misin- like misinformation that has brought on fear, but then also this like sanctimonious nature, which is weird. It's this combination yeah. of being afraid of everything, but then also thinking that you're better than people who aren't yeah. making those fear-based choices. Yeah, it's very interesting what you say there about your real life experience, because they say we've had Vance Crow on, we've had Miles on. And when they've gone and confronted their opposition in real life, they've said they're fine. They're just very reasonable people. Whereas you're saying the comments se- section was actually what they were like. I mean, this is in my in my film, actual video of of this happening. Yeah. This lady, um, like just yelling. And then, yes, there are the people who are more reasonable and willing to engage in discussion. But I think for some of these moms, especially, it is so personal. They are yeah. taking this so personally because I, I'm thinking at this point of the parents who who are convinced that vaccines gave their children autism. OK, yeah. so you have this parent who is so fired up about this cause because maybe they feel like somehow they made the wrong decision and harmed their child because they they buy into these kind of irrational beliefs. Yeah. So parents feel they carry this shame and guilt and doubt about their own decisions and then I think that's what sometimes leads them to lash out at what who they consider to be the opposition. So, you know, this mom who was yelling at, at my friend, I think she probably was convinced that her child had some, you know, health problems because of Monsanto, maybe. Yeah. So they they carry this personal bit with them that, I don't know, I mean, I, I get it, but at the same time, that's just not necessarily how I view the world. So... You know, you have to look at them with, with I guess, some sort of compassion because yeah. they're they're just scared. <laughs> they're they're scared. They're scared, and they want they want what's best for their kids, but they've just bought into a narrative that is not based in fact. Yeah. I think it makes sense that people like Vance and Miles would receive a little bit of a better reception 
than people who are going out advocating for parenting specifically, because parenting is a little bit more of an important life issue uh, when you're talking about science in direct relation to parenting. So I think that probably makes sense that that's why there's more vitriol directed towards science advocates who are supportive of GMOs and vaccines and that kind of thing. Yeah, and like in that kind of situation too, I mean, you figure anybody who's going to a mom's across America or March Against Monsanto type of event, they are so far on the other side of things. They're not necessarily the people on the fence that we're going to convince. So they're they're coming to it already looking at Monsanto or looking at biotechnology in general as kind of this evil thing. So I think like those those are not the people that we're going to necessarily have the most productive conversations with. It's more the people who haven't made up their minds yet, I think. Yeah, and that's true all across the board, I think, with no matter what issue you're tackling. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with Vans and with other friends. Like, I had a, this long conversation with my friend Alex the other day about, like, how do you change people's minds? And I think that's one of the biggest questions in all of this is how how do you change people's minds about things like GMOs or vaccines or alternative medicine. And it's it's finding that sweet spot of appealing to kind of both like hearts and minds, like presenting facts, but in a sort of compelling narrative. I think that's what people like Moms Across America and the celebrities like Jenny McCarthy are good at is appealing to people's hearts with a lot of bullshit. Yeah. So it's tricky on the other side to bring the facts with the, you know, tug on the heartstrings a little bit. Yeah, the challenge is to turn the conversation towards what other people value while at the same time keeping integrity with the facts and the science. And yeah. the skeptics, we tell each other all the time in our own little groups that science doesn't care about what you believe. It doesn't care about what you want or what you feel. And that's true, but that line doesn't really help when you're trying to change minds. So the challenge is to find that balance to connect with people's subjective values in a way that is in line with scientific evidence. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's why I wanted to do a a movie that brought the, the science and evidence, but put a face on it that made it seem more human. Like, I mean, moms, women who are actually scientists or science communicators and can also be relatable to the audience. Yeah. So it's that mix of, okay, here's some real people telling me some, you know, hopefully interesting and valuable information, and they actually know what they're talking about. Kind of the opposite of like Gwyneth Paltrow just going to Washington, D.C. and standing there and saying like, hey, I'm here as a mom. GMOs are bad. I mean, no, that's not how it should work. Just because you're a celebrity, you shouldn't just get to like pop over to Washington, make a statement, have people believe you. And then a whole culture comes around this misinformation. And you also kind of feel that with the, like I said, this moment blogging to be, it's actually very difficult to kind of criticize your opposition because you've got to tread so lightly because, you know, you are touching on one of the most personal and, you know, most instinctive kind of things that a person can do in their lives. Yeah. So it's really about being sensitive to the fact that at the end of the day, everybody wants what's best for their children and nobody wants to feel like they're doing it wrong because I mean, really it's like, it's the most, in some ways it's like the most important job anybody has raising another human, caring about this other person's life. I mean, it's, it's huge. It's, it's an enormous responsibility and you want to do your best. And so that's why all of these conversations have to start from a place of like, okay, you're a parent. I'm a parent. We like we have that common ground like that. And that's something that I've talked about with Vance a lot is you find the common ground and you have conversations. And it's not just like coming in fighting because that I mean, that that brings you nowhere. You're not going to be successful if you just go in and and fight people on on their choices. And because it's especially when it comes to parenting, you question somebody's choices. It's like you're questioning who they are. This is a question I like to ask skeptical activists of all kinds who I get to talk to. Have you had any experience with somebody changing their minds as a result of the conversation you've had with them or the work you've done? I Yeah, I mean, I've I've had a couple. I do remember 
early on in, in doing Science Moms, I did get a message to the Facebook page that I, I corresponded with this woman because she was asking me about, about breastfeeding and formula feeding. And again, I, I made it clear, like, I'm not, I'm not a doctor. I'm not an expert, whatever. And, but she said she was feeling a lot of pressure to just exclusively breastfeed. She was feeling a lot of stress about this. And I kind of, I gave her my experience as a parent. And I was like, well, I, according to my conversations with my pediatrician and my experience, like I formula fed, I breastfed, I did both. And it relieved my stress. My kids are good. Just my experience. You shouldn't feel ashamed if you have to make a decision one way or the other. And um, she ended up writing back and saying that thank you. And it empowered her to make a choice that was good for her. So that was cool. I had another experience. I guess it was maybe a couple months ago. I went grocery shopping wearing a t-shirt that my friend Dan, who runs the um, a science enthusiast blog and Facebook page that he sells, it's like um, GMOs are safe, vaccines work, and everything is a chemical. So I wore it to Trader Joe's. Just that's what I happened to be wearing that day. And the cashier asked me like, oh, what's on your shirt? And she's like, okay, I agree about I agree about vaccines. Yes, everything's a chemical. And GMOs, what she said totally stuck with me because she said, I guess I'm okay with eating them myself, but I'm not going to feed them to a small child. And I was like, okay, okay that, that's um, okay, fine. Well, let's talk about this. So I said to her, I was like, well, I have a couple of small children and they eat all the things. I'm not checking for, for GMOs or whatever. And, um, and so I saw her actually like thinking about that and she, it just, and so I just ended up having a conversation with her. There, luckily, there was no one else behind me in the line. But I kind of explained I was making a movie about this stuff. And I have some great friends who are parents and scientists and totally back all this stuff. And it's not just about Monsanto. And at the end of the conversation, she was like, OK, I am, um, you know, I think I'm going to look more into this because I don't know that I was right about it. So I had that conversation and that felt really good afterwards to be like, okay, that maybe kind of worked just talking to this stranger at the grocery yeah. store. Yeah, Cause I think all you need to really hear is I'm going to think about it. If you get yeah. that, then I think that's a lot of people seem to be, have the idea you've, you've got to have the silver bullet that'll convert to everyone. But yeah. I think at the end of the day, if you just get someone to say, well, I'm going to think about what you said, I don't agree with you, but I'll give it some thoughts then. I think that's a victory at the end of the day in itself. It is because, right, it's not to just convert somebody in that moment, because then it's like, is that as meaningful if somebody just on the spot says, OK, I changed my mind? Because I, I don't know that that's how that's not how the mind works. You don't just yeah. change it in that moment. So you give somebody that seed, you know, plant that seed, they think about it, and then hopefully they come to it on their own because, I think at the end of the day, critical thinking is one of the biggest goals in all this, because that's applied not just to like changing your mind about one thing. It's everything. So whether it's children or adults who need a little help with that, it's I think it comes down to critical thinking is huge right now, especially right now. Yeah, so I suppose might as well ask because you're here to speak. You've know, spent a good half an hour on the mommy blog. So, so the Science Moms Project, how did this come about exactly? So, so I said, I, I rarely read any quote unquote mommy blogs, but there's always been one parenting blog website that I've liked and it's called Grounded Parents. And I remember one night I was up like, you know, middle of the night feeding my younger son, you know, just looking at Grounded Parents. And I saw this, um, they called it the Moms for GMOs letter, this open letter to celebrities essentially saying, you know, like, hey, guys, you're spreading mis like misinformation about about food and about GMOs and about all these things. And I'm reading this letter thinking, oh, OK, there are other moms and women out there who feel the same way I do about food and about these issues. That's really cool. So, OK, I kind of connected with that in the moment. And then um, as I was thinking about it and thinking about all like the whole narrative around parenting, which is so based in fear. Here are these women doing something different. Is there a way to shine a little bit of a spotlight on them? And um, I contacted them and just said, I think you guys could be a movie. 
So that's what it was. And so Coven and Anastasia, Jenny, uh, Allison, and Layla, they were like, yeah, let's, let's do it. And so this documentary project was born. And the thing that has been just really cool for me to see is that it does seem like there's a desire for this kind of story to be told. I was able to um, Kickstarter. I mean, I think I set a goal of like $8,000, but ended up getting 11000 to, you know, fund the, the making of this movie. The Facebook page has lots of followers to it. The It's like actually a good internet community, not a total dumpster fire. So <laughs> I, I know, I mean, like I do, I do get the occasional, you know, you're a shill, work for Monsanto. No, Monsanto is not paying for this movie to be made because it would be done and I would <laughs> have more money in my pockets. So yeah, no to all that. But, uh, but yeah, it was just, I felt like there was a need for this this story to be told. Oh, yeah, because you look out there on all the documentaries being made about yeah. parenting and vaccines and GMOs, and the vast, vast majority of them are anti-science stuff, and there's a very small niche out there for real evidence-based, critical thinking-based resources in the sea of all the anti-science and pseudoscience documentaries. Well, yeah, because I think that the stories that they're telling, those are really compelling stories. It's like watching a horror movie, mm-hmm. like GMO OMG. That's I'm sorry, that's a way more compelling story than the one I'm telling. It really is. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, spoiler alert, this stuff is not scary. <laughs> and, but that's how those movies get made, because they're terrifying when you think about it. And plus for GMO OMG, you do have to say that's one of the best titles ever. It's, it's so good. It's so good. Like, I... I get it. Yeah, except it's just all wrong. It's all wrong. Oh, that guy, that guy infuriates me. Watching him was awful. Awful. But I like bad movies, so I like watching these movies. Um, (laughs) Just just because they're awful, but I know that they're bad. Mm -hmm. To somebody who doesn't know, they're watching it and they're just like, oh shit, I need to throw out everything that is like in my pantry right now. I need to empty the fridge, just like the mom does in Consumed. Have you guys all watched Consumed? Oh, I haven't yeah. watched that yet. No. Oh, oh I think it. that's on our list. Oh, you guys, you guys all have to watch Consumed because it's like the room of food movies. <laughs> yep. But what, like, way better shot? Oh, I've you. Seen that bit, uh, League of Nerds. It's yeah, I watched. You talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Kate, uh... you haven't said anything yet. Do you have any words about Consumed to share with us? I'm just trying to remember it. Uh, I remember it, it's boring at times, and then it just goes into just, just goes mental at times. Like, seeing during the film that she's actively getting paranoid. Yeah. Well, the main thing all is... The problem is, you're, you're just getting paranoid. This is just sheer paranoia. And the GMO yeah. goons, I mean... Oh, the GMO cops. The GMO yeah. cops that were just... Oh, I but the main thing I've got to know is, I'll, I'll know if they failed as a film, if they got Danny Glover in, but they didn't get him to say, I'm too old for this GMO shit. I Does he know. Say, he doesn't they, say it. He doesn't How say could it. they have missed that? I, I mean, know. I would have given them he's a little credit. He's anticlimactically just gone, at, I don't know, halfway through the film. I swear, they probably, like, ran out of money to pay him or something, and they're just like, we we just have to, we just have I to I think maybe they ran out just as he was building up to that line that everyone wanted <laughs> yeah. to hear him say. <laughs> yeah, just pretend that it was actually in the script, and, yeah, and then he that, just... That's the only reason I can think to watch that film willingly, is cause it, just to hear that line. Oh, no, there's... But, no, but, like, that movie, though, there's enough reasons. I mean, they're, yeah. like, just... Yeah, seriously, though. But really, though... That narrative that they've crafted in there, it is, it's essentially a woman's descent totally into mental illness. That's what that movie is. But, but is that what it this culture is doing? take the whole GMO things out of it and it would make so much sense. Oh yeah. She's losing her mind in that movie. Cause I've heard it, like even the way, like all the shots are framed, it gives that impression that she's, you know, it's filmed in that kind of weird, hazy way that's like she's not quite there half the time. She was an awful protagonist for a film because when your hero is just losing it, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I just, I questioned so much about that movie, but yet I love it at the same time for its That's badness. She calls out a knife on her mother. That's one of the scenes. Oh, yeah. It's all, it's all really, really bizarre. 
Well, when I first started watching it, I was expecting them to present the character as a wholesome, unblemished, like, virtuous person. I was surprised that this is the kind of person the the writers think that their target audience is going to connect with. And what does that say about the target audience? Well, I think that there's almost like this martyr syndrome that goes with some of this this target audience. Like, look at that blog post that we were reading from yeah. the modern alternative mama. It's like, we're right, but we're the other. And the world is kind of against us, but we need to stick to our morals because we're right. Even if we seem crazy. I, again, I, I don't, I can't relate to it. I, I can't, she is not me, that the um, character in Consumed. But yeah, that's all I can think of is that they all have this little bit of a martyr complex in them. And also just that they understand the world in a way that the rest of us, we, we've been brainwashed or sheeple or whatever. I don't, yeah, all those things. It's one thing I've always wondered, how do you think so much woo and just general pseudoscience crept into the whole, you know, pregnancy and childbirth thing? Because it's overloaded with it now because... Quite recently, one of my siblings, she was pregnant and she got Mother and Baby magazine. I don't know if you have an equivalent in America to something like that. And I read it. I was just yeah. stunned at some of the stuff I was reading in it. But I mean, I'm just wondering, when did this kind of slow kind of take? Because it used to, I think, you know, back in my mom's day, it was very much doctor and matron were just right. And now it seems to have swung so far the other way. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really incredible. I mean, my mom was has been amazed by all of it. She's like, yeah, Natalie, like you you drink formula. You're fine. Like we <laughs> we went, you know, we went to the doctor when you needed to. Like, it, yeah, it's it's baffling to, I think, our parents to some extent that this is what it is like now. But it seems like I don't know when it started, but there's this appeal to everything that happened in the past, like natural is better or the way things were before all this, you know, modern medicine and all the, I, I don't, I don't understand it because in the past, if we really want to talk about it, people died in childbirth. Natural isn't always better, but somehow that's come into the whole parenting thing. I know I took a, um, a childbirth class before I had Milo, my older one. And I feel like the class was pretty much like how to avoid having any sort of medical intervention when you have a baby. And I'm thinking, well, give me some drugs. If the doctor says I need something, let's do it. I mean, I actually ended up needing, I had a C-section. So that, you know, a medical thing. Imagine if I was just at home trying to have a baby in a bathtub or something for real, like bad shit can happen when people just say, okay, doctors are horrible. Modern medicine's horrible. I I don't know. I, I think why test the limits of all this stuff when we have the technology to help everybody be as safe as possible but somewhere it became that we have to be natural whatever that means and and that makes you a better parent it's equated the two together you do it naturally you do things organically you use all those buzzwords and you're just better it's the sanctimony thing that just is awful i think the prevalence of this stuff when it comes to parenting and stuff as common to our everyday experience as food and routine medical care is a consequence largely of the internet age because before the internet this problem this stuff is probably a little bit out there but with the internet we have massive massive amounts of information available at your fingertips and an unfortunate consequence of that embarrassment of riches is that there's an embarrassment of riches of misinformation and false information just nonsense out there and the challenges to sift what's accurate from what's not, and a lot of people don't have the tools or resources to do that. And I think that's why we see a a lot of the prevalence of fear based around everyday experience. Like, uh, in the past, in the 60s, people were afraid of military-industrial complex, and they were afraid of space. They were afraid of things that were relatively, compared to food and medicine today, were a little bit distant from their everyday experience and that was part of the reason why they were afraid of these things but now when we have access to all this information that our grandparents generation can only dream about now we actually have the resources to be afraid 
we actually have the time to be afraid, and that's why we're afraid. As weird as that sounds, I don't know if I'm making sense. It's like we have a lot of privilege, and I guess one of them is to is to make all of these choices and and be afraid of all these things. When, I mean, really, we shouldn't be. We have we have a safe and abundant food supply. We have modern medicine right there. But yet people are making decisions like the lady that recently was treating her child strep throat with dandelion tea and the child died. Have you heard about that one? Isn't it awful that there are multiple cases where people are making these choices? I mean, there was the one in um, in Canada. I'm forgetting when exactly that happened, but I think the the court case was in the spring where the child died because his parents were treating him with naturopathy. And um, yeah, homeopathy and stuff. Yeah, I mean, kid, like children are dying because parents are choosing things that they're saying are natural instead of real medicine. So it's crazy. That, you know, did ever you see that AIDS Sinaitis film, House of Numbers? Yes. Oh, we, we, we did it for the channel. Remember that woman, Christine Maglior? Yeah, apparently she had her child, her four-year-old daughter, was she four years old, three or four, she was young, very young, contracted HIV, and basically she wasn't allowed, she she didn't get the correct medical help that she needed, but uh, the daughter died from that, from an age-related illness. Yeah, I mean, because people are are making choices that are, I mean, like, these are the ones that are infuriating to me. It's like, okay, if you want to choose organic food for your, like, instead of conventional produce for your family, you're just hurting your own wallet because you're paying more money. And that's just a silly choice. These, these choices, like when it comes to medicine, these are really stupid choices that people are making. And that's where it just kills me that parents are doing this. I mean, I I don't know. Yeah, this is where it's like, just mind boggling to me that you're gonna forego real proven medical treatment and not properly treat your child's HIV or give your child dandelion tea for strep throat and dead children. Like, I'm sorry. It's awful. Yeah. It, it is. yeah. But sorry. Should... That, that was super depressing, but no, right. <laughs> no, but I was also going to, there's another thing I've noticed just with mommy blogs and that's their presentation. And I don't know if you notice this, they're always very kind of soft and easy on the eye, the way they present themselves. Whereas, yeah. you know, you go to a lot of your science blogs and it's, it, it, they even look just kind of very cold and hard and all that. Do you think how, do you acts playing a big role in it as well? Yes, there there is definitely a difference between going to a blog and you see like nice colors and pictures of happy children and you know <laughs> nicely made homemade lunches or something. And then you go to a science blog and it's just like it's all the facts and it's all the words and it's looks a little more sterile. It feels more sterile. Yeah. I mean, if somebody is on the fence about what's going to make them feel some good feels about something when they make their decisions, let's go with the mom, yeah. whether or not they're right. I think that the the moms and the kind of general vibe of the organic industry, all of it knows how to appeal to kind of the, the more warm and fuzzy bit. Science is not as good at that. Yeah, it kind of appeals to just that gut reaction you have. Yeah, yeah. And it's the good gut reaction they're trying to bring out, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's brilliant, um, just wrong. Scientists have been struggling with this problem for decades and decades, how to communicate science to the public. And they've had more success in some areas of science than others. I mean, everybody loves astronomy and the fields of science that some scientists have figured out how to make interesting. And I think scientists are just starting to figure out how they should talk about food and agriculture and vaccines and medicine and all that. That area is kind of new territory for figuring out how to popularize it and communicate it effectively and accurately in a way that can resonate with the public. Yeah, the thing that Vance says is that for years and years, our side, we've never, they've, the science side, they've just never felt that there was a need to engage the public. They say, well, they're going to accept it, or why do we really need that? That's not our job. And now they're realizing, oh, we've kind of fallen behind a bit here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that the anti-science side of things has really harnessed the power of storytelling and providing it like a captivating narrative. So I think that the science side of things needs to figure out how to weave together 
storytelling and the facts. A movie that I saw recently that did this really well was um, this documentary called Food Evolution. I went to um, the premiere of it in New York, I guess it was a few weeks ago, and it's a new documentary narrated by Neil deGrasse Tyson focusing on biotechnology and GMOs. It provided a lot of facts, but it told a really good story. It brought the issue of biotechnology not just here in America, but in other parts of the world, like talked about how biotechnology can help people in Africa who are struggling to grow their banana crops because they're dying. And so we need genetic modification to help people outside of just here. It puts a personal spin on it. And it, I think it would make an audience compelled to think a little bit more about these issues as a greater, greater whole. So, um, yeah, I think telling stories along with the facts is really important right now with science. And also, um, this will probably bring you in a bit more, Nathan, the role journalism has had to play in all of this. Because, yeah, I know we kind of joke with Nathan that we hired him for this show because we needed a journalist, so we all had someone to look down on. But, <laughs> you know, there, it is quite, I mean, there's a bit of truth to that. You know, not you personally, Nathan, obviously, but that's <laughs> that journalism maybe hasn't stepped up to the plate at times for this. You know yourself that I'm one of the biggest critics of journalism, in America at least, and actually it's a problem in the UK and Australia and other parts of the Western world as well. The journalistic media really gravitates toward the fear of the anti-science and pseudoscience crowd. There's a story there, there's a conflict. It's people versus these nameless, faceless scientists and corporations, and that really draws writers in with the conflict angle. And science and facts get left behind in that process because it's hard to, just like with scientists communicating with the public, it's hard for journalists to take what a scientist tells them and translate it in a way that's not just a catalog of facts and actually make a story out of it. So when scientists are trying to create a narrative that's compelling and accurate at the same time, that's exactly what journalists are doing when they do science and they fail at it more often yeah. than the scientists themselves do, and that's saying a lot, because journalists are supposed to know how to connect to the public. They're the liaison between the public and the subjects that they're interfacing with and writing about. So really, I mean, I think on the, the other side of things, they like they use anecdotes a lot, right, in place of evidence. So doesn't it just make sense to also use anecdotes on the science side of things and the evidence. So you have both. So it's like, how do you argue with that? Yeah. I mean, false balance is a big problem where they're taking two sides of an issue that doesn't have equal merit in terms of evidence and they're presenting it on a false scale as these are their equally valid points of view when more often than not, yeah. they're not. But so e even in that area of let's pick an anecdote from the science side and let's pick an anecdote from the pseudoscience side, even if they do that, they're still going to end up creating a false balance, potentially. Yeah, I guess like allowing that, you know, having like Bill Nye debate Ken Ham about the arc and evolution and that kind of thing. It's like offering both as equally yeah. valid in some sense, like it's maybe similar. Yeah, because it's like something I've referenced to here in the UK. We do have a broadcasting standard of non-bias where you report on a story and you have to do unbiasedly. And you know, it was a good example a few years ago. You've heard of Simon Singh, the mm -hmm. he's quite yeah. a famous skeptic and mathematician. Yeah, and and does story, good thinking, a, right? Yeah, and it was a story about homeopathy and they had him on with a homeopath. And I'm sitting there, I know that, you know, Simon Singh kind of knows the stuff and the homeopath, yeah, it's just... <laughs> You know, you know, we know all know what homeopathy is, but I know that, you know, the person next door to me is going to sit there and I say, oh, they're both equally, you know, it's important here. Right, because they're, you know, if they're both sort of presented in some sense as like experts in their yeah. field, I mean, I guess, yeah, I mean, you can be an expert in a field of bullshit. Really, you've put in the time to get that expertise. But uh, but yes, it is different for the person who doesn't really know much about either side if they're given both on equal footing yeah the concept of balance in journalism used to mean something good decades ago it doesn't mean the same thing it means now nowadays when people talk about yeah. balance they talk about false balance that we've been talking about uh, in the past if you have a story that involves two sides of an argument 
balance just meant fairly representing both in terms of what they have to offer. So if one side has little to offer, you let them offer that little bit. If the other side has a lot more to offer in terms of evidence and reason, you let that come through and prevail. And you still have a story about an argument going on in a conflict, but you present it in an honest way and in an accurate way. And that's what balance used to mean. Yeah, I think uh, one, sorry, one good example of that is the movie Spotlight. You said, Nathan, that was just, that is kind of the standard. And it's just that they allowed the church to have a response, you know, just to, and is that kind of what, that's sort of what balance really means there. They allow the church, well, this is our response to the story and that's it. You know, there's no real way they can actually say we were right to do what we did there. Yeah. Bringing it back to skeptical parenting, there needs to be a way for the media to let all these parents who have concerns voice their concerns, but they also need to be receptive of scientists and experts who have knowledge in the field relating to what these parents are concerned about have their voice too. Even though it doesn't sound as exciting or scary as what the scared parents are talking about, let them have their say. Let the concern be voiced and let the reassurance on the side of evidence and reason be voiced as well. And that's something that hasn't happened in that particular subject that we're talking about today. Yeah, I mean, because I think that there just is so much fear and misinformation out there and parents don't need to be as scared as they are. And I think ultimately, like the stuff I'm I'm trying to do with the movie or you know, the the things that, you know, a lot of the people that I know that run different science sites and have different projects going on, podcasts, whatever, are trying to do is just, I guess, reassure people that there's a lot in the world that is a lot less scary than we think or that people think. Yeah. And I think especially for parents, it's, I think, a lot, a lot worse for a parent themselves to feel the stress and pressure associated with all these things than to feed their child to GMO. And that's not even a thing. Like, that's not even a like a GMO, I'm not just going to give Milo be like, Here, here's a GMO to eat, buddy. Like, I'm going to sprinkle some all over your food. You're going to have all the GMOs for breakfast today. No, like, that's not how it works either. But no, I mean, the world is not this terrifying of a place for parents. And the child is going to be a lot worse off, I think, if the parents are just balls of stress and nerves than if the parents kind of chill on a little of this stuff and just focus on what's important. Yeah, the key to turning this whole thing around is probably focusing on and emphasizing the fact that in our day and age today, we're living in the best time of human history yet. If we look back at human history in the past and our generation now, it's the best time to be alive. And a lot of writers have written about that in recent years, about longevity being up, health being at its highest quality it's ever been, the food we eat being at the highest quality it's ever been because of science and technology. There's a lot of reasons to accept that we have a lot to be thankful for, and we're extremely fortunate to live in the time we do now. If you want to have a look at what an all-organic diet looks like, look at our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Well, and then that, then the whole fact that, you know, modification of food has been happening, not just in labs. And it's not like all this Franken food thing. I mean, how much of what we eat is truly like natural, meaning the way it was yeah. in the past. But people don't know these things. And how, I mean, I guess, how would they know? But maybe that's part of the problem is that education about these issues maybe should start taking place Make it part of school. I don't know. Like, these are important things that are just informing decisions that people make in their lives and are completely misinformed on them. So I think just the main message that we've got to be getting out is things are actually pretty damn good right now. Yeah. I, I know it's some things are overshadowed, but on the whole, we're in a pretty good situation. And it's, yeah, there's work to be done, but it is getting better all the time. I like that. I like that optimism. And like, because yes, it does need to be mentioned more, especially, I mean, now we're, we're living in kind of weird times here, but on a day to day basis, things like food and health, we're, we're very fortunate. Yeah. And, and that should be appreciated. We should be allowed to appreciate that too, without running scared all the time. Yeah. It was just on my thread. There's two really good books I can recommend for everyone. That's one, Abundance, the Future is Better Than You Think. And 
one I know Nathan and well Vance preaches this book to the is the rational optimist. Uh, I think those are two worthwhile books, you know, and you will see things aren't that bad overall. Uh, another one I would recommend is Dan Gardner's book Risk. Uh, I think it was printed in the UK as Risk: The Science and Politics of Fear, and here in the US it was published yeah. as The Science of Fear. And he goes into the psychology behind what makes us tick. Basically, there's the rational side of us, the head, and there's the emotional reactive side of us, the gut. And industries and markets and media have really had a leg up on the psychology. They've been like five years ahead of the psychology, figuring out how to get people to buy their products and how to push the right button psychologically and figuring out the cognitive biases and cognitive tendencies that make us unconsciously default to the flight mode instead of the fight mode. And that book makes a sense of a lot of why parents, especially young parents, are afraid of what they're afraid of. That, that was going to be my recommendation. That's a great book. Yeah. Oh, I stole your fire there. Yeah, it's okay. It's all right. No, that, that, was, a, that was a really good summary. Um, I Because I read that one. It was recommended to me by Buck. Before I did his show, um, because we, we talked, we talked about fear. That was one of the things I found interesting. Yeah. Fear, the room and, um, atheism. <laughs> Three things that just go not, not at all together, but sort of sum up my life, I guess. So yeah. I think the room makes you question your own existence in a weird yeah. way. Oh, oh, it does. It does. But, um, oh my, that, yeah, I could talk about that movie for <laughs> so many hours. Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody have any final thoughts? I guess I'll turn it over to Natalie last and see if either you, Cal, or you yeah. can have any final thoughts about uh, this whole area. Uh, no final thoughts. Just a uh, big thank you to Natalie for coming along. It's been a great talk. And yeah, we'll uh, hopefully have you back on in the future at some point. I would be happy to come back anytime. Oh, uh, Kitch. Uh, Kitch. Go on, go on. <laughs> Oh, he's still here. At, we should have a, just had a kind of beep, beep, beep going in for you on the whole show. <laughs> yeah, so uh, no, no real final thoughts. Just thank you to, to Natalie for, for coming on. It's been, it's been great. I uh, wish I'd have been uh, on a different day, but sure, can't be helped, I suppose. Um, yeah, so it's been great having you on. Well, thank you. So um, I, I guess I'll I'll have to come back on another time when you're more like conscious, yeah. maybe. Uh, but no, like, thank you guys so much for having me. I think I, I hopefully said some things that were decently interesting. I don't know. Um, If people want to hear me do some other stuff, I have a podcast. Should I say the name of the podcast? Oh, yeah, or no, you already right. did. But, uh, you can um, say it again. All right. It's the Science Enthusiast podcast um, that I do with with my friend Dan. And we get some some pretty interesting guests and talk about some fun stuff like, you know, science and cannibalism and pretty much anything that's been on the League of Nerds, I've determined we end up doing at some point. Yeah. So that's yeah, just we all exist kind of in the same podcasty world. I think yeah. all of us. But yeah, like, thank you. This has been super fun. And I would totally come back. And if people want to follow you on Twitter or any other social media, where can they find you? Oh, um, so Twitter is, um, at N C N E W E L L. So at N C Newell on Facebook. I have the Science Moms, um, Facebook page. And then I have another page called Skeptical Parenting. That's more just like weird memes sometimes oh, and, and, just, and articles and stuff. And just but. for anyone that's into uh, when do you expect the movie to be out? So the movie I am hoping, you know, at this time, I'm going to say springtime 2017. I want to okay. say winter, but let's let's do spring because All this, right. stuff, this stuff takes a long, it takes a long time to yeah. get animations and post-production type of stuff. But yeah, it has a rough cut already. I'll, you know, I'll, maybe I'll send it to you guys. You can watch it. That'd be and, awesome. Yeah. And get a little sneak peek. Yeah. I sent it to um, James and Miles before I did their episode because we right. really focused on that, but I'll send it to you guys. You can watch it. Oh, yeah, definitely yeah. watch this. Definitely. All right, well, thank you, everyone, for being here, and thank you, Natalie, for being here as our guest. Have a good holiday season, everyone. You too. And, yeah, we can preview our next guest, which will be in January, which we're very happy to do. I think we can do that, Nathan, can't we? You can give us a someone we're very excited to speak to there. Uh, January, that is Abigail Harrison. 
Mm. Yes, it is indeed. Yes. She is an aspiring astronaut studying with some senior people in that field, and uh, her goal is to be the first person or among the first people to set foot on Mars, and she has a blog and some videos sharing what she's learned and sharing some good science. We'll have her on. Uh, she's a she's a pretty, pretty remarkable young person. Her drive and her enthusiasm is kind of just so infectious when you read her writings. Yeah, and uh, before we sign out, I'll also mention again the Patreon account we have for anybody who wants to support the show on Patreon. You can do that now, and you get access to early shows before they become public, and also extended interviews if we ever do that. So that's patreon.com slash drawing with logic. And I think that pretty much covers yep. all the things we need to say at the end of the show. So goodbye, everyone. Have a good weekend. And I'll see you when I see you next. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye. everybody. Bye. Thank you for listening to Trolling with Logic. And a very big thank you to our patrons for supporting the show. Our patrons to thank this episode are Joshua from the Society for the Advancement of Science. Please check out his YouTube channel below and also Microblogginism. There are links to the channels below. Again, thank you very much for your support. It makes a huge difference to the show.